So with that in mind, go back to the beginning. What Paul's saying to the Colossians is, if you've been raised with Christ, which by which he doesn't refer, he doesn't mean the final resurrection. He means the sacramental resurrection that takes place in baptism. So if you've been raised with Christ through baptism, then you need to seek the things that are above where Christ is. In other words, live according to the ethos, the ethics, not of the earthly city, but of the heavenly city of Jerusalem, the heavenly kingdom, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, on heavenly realities, not on the things of the earth. Now, let me pause here. Notice this is really important. On the one hand, Paul has a kind of dualism between heaven and earth, right? But this isn't an escapism. He's not trying to say heaven good, earth bad, spirit good, body bad, as you might find in some kind of dualistic or Gnostic or Manichaean errors later on in early Christianity. The reason we seek the things that are above is not because the earth isn't good. It is good. Genesis 1 says it's good. The reason we seek the things that are of heaven is not because the earth isn't good. It is good. God made it. But we seek the things of heaven and the things that are above because Christ is there. Because Christ is reigning in his glorified and resurrected body, where? Not on earth, but at the right hand of the Father. Right? So Paul's trying to get the Colossians to, to coin a phrase, lift up their hearts, right? To the invisible reality of the heaven and the heavenly city where they belong, because that's where their king is. Now, is he going to return? Yes. But right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So they have to understand that they don't live for this world in a world anymore. They live for the world to come. And that's why he says, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. So when you were baptized, this is remarkable. You not only died to sin, you not only had your sins forgiven, you didn't just become a member of like the local parish church in, in Colossae. Your actual life was caught up and united to the risen and exalted Christ so that your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You belong to that heavenly Jerusalem. That's where your true citizenship is. That's your destiny. That's your ultimate home. So when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now he's pointing to the final resurrection at the time of the parousia. Now here's the key. Therefore, next verse, put to death what is earthly in you. So here Paul uses the language of mortification. We, we talk about mortification. Sometimes people will say, I was mortified, meaning you know, I was scared to death. But in the language of the spiritual tradition of the church, mortification has to do with voluntarily putting to death things, aspects of our life that are either earthly or sinful or both. Here Paul lists sins. He doesn't just say avoid them. He doesn't just say, you know, do your best to try to not do them, right? He says, kill them. Put to death in you, therefore, what? Number one, immorality. The Greek word there is porneia. So he's not just, he's not just talking about cheating on your taxes. He's talking about sexual immorality. Right? And in a first century Jewish context, he would mean any sexual act outside of the marital covenant it would be porneia. Prostitution, adultery, homosexual acts, incest, anything outside of the marital covenant, that's porneia. So his first thing he's got to tell these pagans at Colossae that they can't do is they can't live according to the sexual mores or sexual immorality of the pagan culture of their time. Second, impurity. Um, the Greek word here is akatharsia. Now, there's debate about exactly what he means by that. In a Jewish context, the term impurity would frequently be used to refer to ritual impurities, like in the Old Testament, right? Um, where a person might not wash at the time they're supposed to wash, or they might uh, touch a corpse, or they might eat an impure food, right? But Paul's not, can't be referring to that because he's not talking to Jews, he's talking to Gentiles. So in a Gentile context, impurity, akatharsia, a strong case can be made that he's referring there again to sexual morality, particularly, as we might use the expression, dirty or perverted acts with the body it would be unfitting. Not just sinful, but, but somehow perverted. So put to death immorality, put to death impurity, put to death uh, passion, evil desire, covetousness, 
Covetousness um, is, uh, the Greek word pleonexia is a kind of envy that leads to the accumulation of possessions or wealth, right? It tends to be focused on, uh, like the commandment, right? Don't covet your neighbor's ox or his donkey or any of his possessions, okay? So covetousness, which he says is idolatry. It's actually the worship of, of a creature over the creator. On account of these, porneia, uh, perversity, impurity, evil desires, passion, covetousness, and idolatry, the wrath of God is coming. So Paul's making really clear here that these are grave sins. Objectively, these are grave sins, and they will be punished by the wrath of God. So he's preparing the Colossians to recognize something that they wouldn't have recognized as Gentiles necessarily, namely that their human actions have eternal consequences. Right? So in a Gentile context, um, you could definitely, I mean, they had an idea of supernatural punishment. Like if you angered the gods because you didn't pay sacrifices, the gods might punish you with a plague or with a, a, a famine or a war or something like that, right? But these would be temporal punishments for, for faults. Here, Paul's trying to get them to realize, no, there's going to be eternal punishment for certain sins. And he lists the problem, the ones he begins uh, always with porneia. Paul is always the first one he's got to deal with because the Gentile cultures were so rampant with it. It was one of the first things that he had to get his converts to stop doing in order to change their lives and live lives in Christ. Um, but I added a verse too because the list that he gives here, unfortunately, when the lectionary skips these couple of verses in the middle, it leaves out a few of the vices that Paul lists, and I thought it'd be helpful to mention them here. Anger, wrath, Malice, malice is the desire to do ill to someone else. Slander, right? So to lie about someone publicly to the destruction of their, of their um, reputation is a very grave sin. And also, note this, foul talk from your mouth. So that last expression there is very interesting. Iskrologia, that word, literally means like logia words, right? Iskrologia is like dirty words or foul talk, foul words, bad language. That's a looser translation. Um, but, and also lying. Don't lie to each other. Okay. Those are the, that's your old way of life. The new way of life doesn't have any place for that. Um, and if you want an example of that, the, the, in particular the one on foul talk, because this is something that I, I've noticed, it's not always clear to me that readers in the New Testament walk away from it knowing that Paul and Jesus expect the disciples of Jesus to not use profanity and cursing. But Paul's really clear here. So, for example, um, there's, an, a, there's a, simil, a use of a similar term in Aristotle. So, in uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, he's discussing all kinds of ethical issues, and one of the things he brings up is bad language. And this is what Aristotle says. If you want to, like, context for what, what Paul might be referring to, Aristotle writes, quote, the well-bred man's jesting differs from that of a vulgar man, and the joking of an educated man from that of an uneducated. One may see this even from the old and new comedies. To the authors of the former, indecency of language, iscrologia, was amusing. To those of the latter, innuendo is more so. And these differ in no small degree in respect of propriety. That's from the Nicomachean Ethics 1128a. So you notice there, Aristotle uses the term ascrologia, the same word Paul uses here, um, to refer to the difference between newer comedies, which use more innuendo, in, innuendo, subtle things, than the foul language of the older comedies, the kind of raunchy language that was part of the older comedies. So you can see here, just Aristotle recognizing that Profanity, bad language, dirty talk, we might say, dirty words, are part of Gentile culture. It's part of pop culture, the culture of the, these comedies, right? And Aristotle says that's actually shouldn't be part of the educated man's vocabulary. I mean, that's the basic thrust of, of the quotation here. But Paul is making that much stronger. He's saying, put all foul talk out of your mouth if you're in Christ. Don't walk according to the ways that you did when you were a Gentile. That has no place in your mouth anymore. Okay.